7.30. Yep, 7.30. Listo. Plain, plain leaves and the plain leaves. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Abear. Of course, if you're at Wilcrest, you know this, uh, but I know a lot of you are from the various partner churches that are connected with Kokama Project. So I'm, we are one of the churches, one of the other churches, and uh, I'm just running the, the tech for Sam and for everybody else. Uh, that's my role tonight. Um, I want to just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, I know this goes without saying, but please don't unmute um, unless you're one of our speakers and then at the appropriate time, yes. Um, we're, I think, going to have maybe 150, 200 people in on the call. And so, you know, things will get really crazy if you're doing dishes in the background. <clears throat> um, the other thing is, please don't screen share either because that will just take over everybody's thing and it will get you deported. So you're not just kicked out of the call, you're deported. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to embrace the power while I have it. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and get started here. And our, our first thing that, that I like to do on a mission trip is, you know, missions comes from the heart of God. And so uh, we like to uh, focus on scripture. And so I've asked Sam Waltman, uh, all of our speakers tonight, I'm not going to give very long introductions, but for all of our speakers, uh, you can see who they are in the handout if you want to know a little bit more about them. Uh, so Sam, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, good to uh, share this time with everybody tonight. It's exciting to be part of what God is doing. He's working all over the world and through so many people, but tonight we celebrate the fact that he's working through the Nicholson's through Sam and Marcy in a particular place in a per Peruvian jungle on a, in a river village with a particular tribe that we know as the Kokamas. So as we're thinking about missions, you know, it's an exciting thing to be part of missions, but the question might be, how many missions are there? And as a matter of fact, there's really only one mission and it starts with God. He has a particular mission and for us to be in involved in mission projects, plural, uh, is to be part of his mission, singular. But we have to kind of understand what that is. So I'm trying to just fly th right, right through that as we're thinking about how uh, um, the Kokama project is part of that one mission. Uh, we all know that there's uh, a fall of man in Genesis chapter three, uh, back to early part of the, of the Bible, there's the fall of man, but there's a second fall and it's the fall of the nations or the people groups of the world. And if we looked a few chapters later after chapter three, we go to chapter 11. And in chapter 11, we're familiar with the story of the fall of uh, the Tower of Babel and the people of Babel there. And uh, we see this, this story, it starts out in verse one. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Can you imagine that there were not a lot of languages. Everybody spoke the same thing. And uh, it goes on down further in the story in verse four, they said, come let us build for ourselves a tower whose top will reach into heaven, make for ourselves a name. And so a lot of what they were doing was just focused on them. But the Lord said in verse five, that in verse six, actually, behold, these people, all they had the same language. And this is what they began to do with the same language. And so nothing is impossible for them now. Let's go down, speaking to the Godhead, come let us go down and do two things. Let's confuse their language so they will not understand one another's speech. And then secondly, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So because of sin, there came to be many people groups scattered across the face of the earth, speaking many languages. And so God's mission began right there, and that was to restore and redeem the people groups, the, the tribes, the nations of the world. And this is the mission that he is on. Throughout the Old Testament, he often speaks about how he's going to be exalted in all of the nations throughout the earth. And he began in the very next chapter of Genesis in chapter 12 to call one man, Abraham or as he was known in chapter 12, as just Abram. And he said, go forth from your country, from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I'll show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you'll be a, uh, you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. The ones who curse, you'll, uh, curse you, I will curse. 
and in you all the families, or we might say all the peoples or all the nations of the earth, will be blessed through what God would begin through Abraham. So we began with the confusion at Babel, but now with a covenant with one man, Abraham, he would begin one nation that would be his people, and through that one nation would come one Savior, through the Israelites would come Jesus. And so this is the, this is the mission that God has been on, not just the salvation of people in general, but the restoration of the nations from the confusion that was created at Babel, where he, he, he disturbed what they were doing and spread them out and confused them with many languages so that there would be a covenant with Abraham that would lead to a cross, the cross of Christ. And in, in, uh, in this with Jesus and his disciples, he turned to them one time and said, the mission that I'm on is now your, mi your mission. He said, he said, just as the Father has sent me, so send I you. The same mission given to him is now passed on to you and me. And that's the one mission that we're involved in. You know, if we were to go to the very end of, of, of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 5 and also in Revelation 7, verse 9 in both, case, both cases, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book, to bring its seals. You were slain and purchased for God. With your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And then in, in chapter 7, verse 9, uh, John wrote in, in uh, the Revelation, after these things I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation, all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne, before the land. So this is the completion, the culmination of God's mission as we see it in the revelation of what God has shown us for the future. So the question is, what is our part in that? As God is restoring the nations to himself, redeeming people from every nation so that at the end, in heaven, in eternity, there's representation, there are people from every nation and all of the languages are brought together in unity. All the peoples of the world, the tribes are brought together. How is this happening? It's happening through God's people, the church, through you and me. As we're part of projects like the Kokama Project, Jesus looked at his disciples uh, before he ascended to heaven in Matthew 28. And he said, all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. And because of that, he said, therefore, because all power has been given to me, you go now and you make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey and observe all that I've commanded you. And remember this, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age or the end of the mission, we might say. This is God's one and only mission. This is the mission that he's given us. And, you know, we have, um, we've had some great resources in understanding the mission and uh, understanding where to put our, what are, where to put, invest our time and our efforts in that. One of my favorite ones is a website that uh, is called joshuaproject.net. You might make a note of that, joshuaproject.net. On that website, you can find uh, a comprehensive list in every country of all of the tribes, all of the people groups in every country. You know, there's only about 200 countries or so, but Joshua Project counts over 17,000 tribes or people groups, nations. I imagine if we took the time, we could even find the Kokamas, the Kokama tribe there. And to see that they are represented on earth and they will be represented in heaven. And I thank God that he's calling people, his own people, like Sam and Marcy Nicholson, to be part of that mission, that one mission. And through our friendship with them, through our, our relationship with them, allowing us to partner with them in various ways, we can find our part in God's one and only mission. So it's exciting to know that tonight, exciting that we, although we can't be in that river village with them tonight, we can be part of this virtual mission trip. And I'd like to just say a brief prayer as we close. Thank you, Lord, for 
explaining to us through your word what you're about, what you're up to, so that we might focus our efforts and our priorities on what you're doing. We want to join you in that. Thank you for the Nicholsons. Thank you for the Cocamas and for leading all of us to have a part in what you're doing there in Peru. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, so Sam gave us a very short overlook at, at what God is doing with the nations in Scripture, but all of those Scriptures are in the handout. If you didn't receive the email for some reason, I have pasted the link to the handout in the chat, so you can open that up and get the handout, which has a lot more information in it. And so at this time, I want to turn it over to Zach Nicholson, who is the chairman of the board for the Kokama Project. Yeah, hey, greetings, friends, and we're glad that you're here to uh, go on a virtual trip. Our prayer is that you'll take your first virtual trip and then end up taking your physical trip to the jungle with us one day. But we are so thankful that you're here. I get the privilege of introducing the Kokama Project. And I don't think I could do a better job for those of you who may be uh, new and not know much about the Kokama Project. I don't think I could do a better job tonight uh, than what's done on the website. So after our time is over, maybe this evening or tomorrow, I would encourage you to go to the kokamaproject.org, check it out. It tells a story. It gives all kinds of fantastic information. It shares with you how you can become a prayer partner, how you can become a financial partner with us. It gives an incredible uh, opening view of the Kokama Project. Now you may not know why uh, this ministry is called the Kokama Project. Well, the Kokama people is a tribe of mostly Peruvian uh, people in, in the Amazon jungles of Peru. They have just a number of villages up and down the different rivers in the jungle in Peru. And so the original vision of the Kokama Project was to establish a ministry inside of one of those villages, uh, in one of those Kokama villages, and minister to those people and bless those people and, and love them and disciple them and train them up so that they could go to other Kokama villages and minister to other Kokama people. And so that's why uh, the name of the ministry is the Kokama Project. However, God is God. And often his vision is a little larger than ours. And uh, we have come to find that after about six or seven years of being um, in ministry, uh, that God has expanded the Kokama Project to about four or five other tribes. And so we're very grateful that God has just given us the chance to see that and to watch uh, him pull it together and really I'm thrilled. I, I feel blessed to be able to watch it happen through a ton of people. A lot of you on here have been a part of God working uh, in those tribes. But for me to be able to see it happen through my parents uh, is pretty cool as a son and then as the chairman of the board. Uh, but I do want to end the introduction by saying a brief word about the founders of the ministry, my mom and dad, uh, Sam and Marcy Nicholson. So um, we went on a mission trip. Golly, I don't even know when it was. It's just years ago we went. And my parents were always senders. You know, in missions, uh, there's people who are disobedient to the call, and there's people who are senders, and there's people who are goers. And my parents have always been senders, and they have sent so many people to the mission field financially and through prayer. And as they prepared for their retirement, they decided they wanted to go on a mission trip. And so I had the fantastic privilege of taking them uh, on their first mission trip as they began to look and think about retirement. And just so happened that they ended up on the banks of that village. And on their first mission trip, right on the banks of that river, God called them uh, to missions and to be a part of it. And so they came home, they got everything in order and prepared to, um, uh, to launch the Kokama project. And so God has just been uh, working through them and through the ministry and through so many of you that have given so much time and prayer and 
finances to the ministry. Um, that's an introduction, and, and, and uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Brian here in a second, but I did want to just close by uh, saying once again, we are glad that you're here. My goodness, there's probably 4,000 things you could be doing right now, but you decided to come on this virtual trip, and so we're blessed by that. And, and again, if you're new and you don't know much about the Kokama Project, would you just check the website out? It'll give you just a ton more information than we'll be able to dump on you tonight. And so with that, I yield my time back to Brian A. Bear. <laughs> All right, Sam, let's go ahead and get you hooked you up. You ready to get started? How do I do this? All right, so share screen. All right. And Here. There you go. Double click. Uh, yep. Yeah. That works. And then? Hey, you're live. All right, can everybody see that? I guess you can. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Zach, for the introduction. And uh, at first, I want to thank Brian so much for putting this together. Uh, you can already tell that I am not the technology guy. Uh, Brian has really done a great job of putting this together. I just want to thank him uh, publicly for doing this. Uh, <clears throat> it was his idea and his uh, all his hard work that's done this. I'm going to go through a, uh, a kind of a bunch of photographs and talk about them. And I know that there's people out there that have seen a lot of this before. But there's also some that really, like Zach said, they don't really know much about Kokama Project. They're new to it. So for the first, uh, say, 10 minutes, I'm going to go back and review and uh, show you how we got here, where we are, uh, things like that. And then, uh, and then we're going to move into what's been going on in the last year or two and uh, what's going on right now. So bear with me if you've already seen some of these photographs and heard the stories behind them. But uh, we're going to move on and uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so that we don't run out of time here. So, uh, first one, little geography uh, lesson. Uh, we are in Peru, which is South America, but we're in the Amazon jungle. And if you look at that, uh, that uh, satellite photo there, of course, you see the big red pin, that's Peru. Uh, the, blue, the blue one with the white circle around it is about where we are. We're kind of in northern part of Peru. Most people uh, you know, they're used to the Hollywood version of the Amazon jungle. So they think about Brazil every time somebody says something about the Amazon jungle. But if you look at the dark green, you can see that it's not only Brazil, but Guyana, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, some in Bolivia. The, the Amazon jungle is a huge ecosystem, absolutely enormous. In fact, it's probably about the size of continental United States. There are very, very few roads in there. Uh, people travel through the jungle on foot or they travel by boat because it's just water everywhere. And so that's kind of where we are in the in northern part of Peru. This is our village. The name of the village is the 9th of October, uh, Nueve de Octubre, uh, named after the day of the year that they were recognized by the government, believe it or not. And that's really not unusual down there. We, uh, we drive down the road to get to where we catch a boat and get to this village, and there's one named the 10th of October. <laughs> a road sign pointing to the, how you get to the 10th of October. So that seems to be a, a common way to name your village. When the government rec recognizes you, you pick the day that they officially do it, and you name your village that. When we, uh, when we first uh, got down there, I don't know if you can see the date down there at the bottom of the page. That's uh, March 11th of 2014, I think. Mine's covered up a little bit. Um, we, uh, this is a property that came for sale. And Marcy and I uh, had uh, uh, talked with the villagers. They, they kept showing me this property. And I thought, I want to own property in the middle of the Amazon jungle. That's crazy. But we found out that their concern was that they could, if, if someone bought it, made a commercial application out of it or something, they wouldn't be able to maybe cross it because they had fields on the other side and that they were worried about it. So uh, Marcy and I uh, broke our piggy banks and bought it just so they could walk across it. This was what was on it in 2014. Now, we, didn't, we weren't able to take possession of it until late, and uh, I think it was September, October of 2014. And this was all that was left. They took, they took their houses, uh, the people that owned it before us, uh, and uh, this was all that was left. So we took that and we made a house. Uh, Marcy calls it her bungalow. And uh, my description is it's like living in a carport in the middle of the Amazon jungle. But you can see we put a tin roof on and uh, 
uh, put a gutter up. You can see the blue trash can down there where we could catch some water. Uh, we had a beautiful master bedroom, and uh, uh, we also had a master bath. Well, it's, I guess, a quarter of a bath or something there. But uh, we actually had people come from the village and, and bring their wives to show them we had a toilet inside the house. Uh, the table to the left over there was the kitchen. And so we had a wonderful time living there for over two years in the middle of the jungle. We recognize we would tell stories, we would do Bible training, and most people that showed up were kids and a few of the women. But we needed to get the men involved, and we learned early on that if we would get uh, a project going that, that they would be interested in, that uh, it would help us draw them out and, and so that we could meet them and begin to build relationships. I've had a thousand times over the years people say, well, so you built boat docks? And said, no, we're building relationships. Boat docks was just one of the ways we would do it. And so this was our very first project, and uh, it worked. We, this, these are village leaders. It wasn't long after that till they showed up at our place and uh, wanted me to uh, join them in one of their leaders' meetings so I would know what was going on. They had already begun to start considering us neighbors. And, of course, Marcy, uh, the kids just are drawn to her like a magnet. I mean, she, she loves them. Uh, this is, uh, you know, she'll take these little, this, these are Bible stories that they're sitting there reading in Spanish. And, uh, of course, if you, if you make cake, I mean, these kids don't ever get anything like this. If you make cake and put chocolate icing on it, you'll have a room full. And little girls just love her. And uh, so she has been just really special for the kids. We probably get, uh, I want to say, 20 to 30 kids every day come down. Marcy provides them with uh, educational tools. Marcy is a, a retired school teacher. So, the, you know, educational uh, uh, toys, things. Uh, actually, we have a, a little fund that we kind of put the money aside. It's, we call it the Children's Project. And uh, when we get, collect enough money, she'll go buy, a, a, what do you call an iPad, a tablet, a, a couple of tablets. And these kids, these kids are sharp. They can, uh, man, they do things on those tablets that I can't do. And they, you know, they're just now kind of getting started with that. And of course that leads us to this. We we're having vacation Bible school here, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and, and you notice the room that they're in, this is the village school, the government bill will usually, and if it's a big enough village, ours probably has four to 500 inhabitants, which is a huge village uh, for this part of the world. And uh, the government will build a school uh, for them. And uh, this is the school. And it, what's so uh, charming about it or exciting to me about it is that there's no roadblocks between us being able to use school facilities to do things like this. They just love it because we're participating and helping the people in their village. And this is a training room that we have built uh, in recent history. I, uh, we also allow them to come and use our facilities. They don't have a you know, a gym or an auditorium to meet in. So when they really need to get a bunch, several of them together, uh, we just say, sure, come on down, use our stuff, you know, use our rooms, use our, use our facilities. And so our relationship with the village has grown over the years. It's just uh, solid as it can be. Uh, the children love, love us, they love Marcy. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's just, it's, it has continued to grow. I always try to tell people that when we first moved in, there was a myth in the jungle that uh, gringos, they, they, uh, when we first moved in, I was the gringo and Marcy was the, the gringo's wife, is what they called us. And, uh, but there's a myth in the jungle that uh, we're, uh, they call us face peelers. Uh, in the middle of the night, we'll come and cut their face off and steal it, which is absurd to us, but to them, it's real, it's reality. That's, they really believe that. And so we've gone from being face peelers to, uh, to being part of the community. They've actually made us citizens of their community. So. Oh, yeah, this is one more of Marcy's children. Uh, this is Thibodeau, and uh, she, raised, she raised this little fellow, and he's full grown right there. He likes to sit on top of her head, and uh, he's, uh, we have another one that's named Boudreaux, and, they, uh, it, and I want to just, you know, we put a link in the uh, handout. I tell jokes. <laughs> we put a link in the handout. I would really encourage you to click on that link and, and go and see Boudreaux and Thibodeau fighting with each other. They have a ball. They play fight. And uh, you'll, your, your children will really love it. All right. What else do we do? Well, in this photograph, you really can't tell. We're pulling a rope. Uh, so 
Well, this is a group from uh, Port Natchez uh, and uh, First Baptist Church in Port Natchez, and they came and they wanted to do manual labor. And so we did, and they pulled that rope, and you can see where the rope goes, goes through a pulley, and we drill in a water well in this case. And uh, it's, it's pretty nasty and pretty hard work, but we had a blast doing this. Uh, some real fellowship and some real times to, to bond with each other, and we've made some really new friends uh, from down in uh, the, the uh, Port Nature's area, and as well as in the, down around New Orleans. Um, this was another project. Uh, water is not a problem. We are in a rainforest here, and we're on a big river, but clean water is, is a terrible problem. Uh, they'll dig a hole in the ground, and, and that's their you know, that's their water supply to drink and to cook with. And of course, they've got dogs and cats and ducks and people and whatever else they've got. And it rains and it runs off in the hole. And, you know, you go look down in the hole, and you see some frogs and some tadpoles down in the water. And so I think we had a total of maybe 18 of these tanks. And we did a project, we raised the money, we, you know, said it's a water project, raised the money. And Got some gutters there. Some of the some of the village uh, roofs uh, have have tin on them. They're not all made out of leaves, and uh, so we were able to uh, get some storage capacity where when it does rain, they can kind of store some water. That was a real successful project. I think it was a, a really kind of a lifesaver too because so many of them get sick from not you know from drinking bad water. Okay, this is believe it or not. Uh, some of our village, uh, the man, is, you know, the gentleman here is named uh, uh, Addison and his wife, Marely. Uh Addison actually works for us. He does construction and maintenance on, on our place. Uh, the guy behind the podium doing the ceremony, that's uh, Pedro. Pedro is a, uh, and a missionary out of Iquitos, and he works for Indigenous Amazon Ministries, which is a, another uh, uh, ministry. Out of, you might want to look them up and click in. I think it's IAMministries.org. Anyhow, Pedro comes out and uh, somehow uh, he began to teach. You have to realize that these people re really never, never, ever have Bible studies and teachings uh, in all of their lives. And uh, somebody will come out and do a, do a, 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 you know, maybe some of them might accept Christ and uh, become a Christian, but they don't really even know what to do next. They don't know what, to, what that means. So, Apparently, Harrison asked uh, uh, Pedro to tell him what, what the Bible says about marriage, so he did. Next thing we know, I think we had eight weddings here, all at one time, one right after the other. And uh, what was so amazing about it was that they found a way to borrow some clothes that looked like this. I mean, they never have clothes that look like that. I, mean, I was just dumbfounded when they started showing up with those clothes. What else do we do? Well, this is this was from back a few years ago, but this is their their church, dirt floor, dog laying in the in the aisle. Um, and one of the things you learn real quick is that you better be prepared because if you have a translator with you, uh, they're going to point to you at time for a message and say you you deliver the message today. So. I was not expecting it the first time. Fortunately, I had enough uh, prepared in my own mind that I was able to go to some scripture and, and deliver a message. But uh, that's kind of the way they do with Visitor. And uh, uh, it's just a, a charming little church with a dirt floor. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it other than to say you're, you're out in the middle of the jungle outdoors. And it's an it's a un unbelievable atmosphere when you're preaching in a place like this. And, well, that's Pedro on the left, but, of course, we do uh, have baptisms in the river. That's the only place we have to, to do them. This, uh, this young man's name is Tito. Uh, he has become a real friend, uh, and there's a long story behind Tito's uh, acceptance of Christ. But uh, Tito and uh, – I'm not changing here. Ah, there we go. Tito and his wife both – uh, her name is uh, Yessie. Uh, he's got his hand on her shoulder there. And then uh, Morelli is the one you saw earlier that was getting married with uh, Harrison. And, of course, Pedro. So whenever we have a baptism like that, uh, everybody in the village just about shows up. And they even, you know, we, we have to walk from our place. I'll show you that in just a second. We'll walk from our place kind of through the village to get down to the water where they baptize. And <laughs> we go through there, and the principal of the school 
starts going room to room and saying, hey, everybody, get out of your class. You need to go down and watch this baptism, which is a whole different world than what we're kind of used to here in the United States. So I think it's pretty charming. It's really neat uh, that they're so uh, up front or, or out in the open about uh, about things like this. So it's really easy. To, I mean, you have a baptism and, and anybody that doesn't know, I mean, they're going to start asking questions. What are y'all doing and why are you doing that? So it really opens the door to be able to witness to them. <laughs> oh, we were 30 miles up the river around the Tigre River, the uh, Tiger River, the Rio Tigre. And uh, there's a little uh, village there where the mouth of the Tigre comes into our river, the Rio Marañón. And uh, this man is one of our favorite pastors. His name is Bernardo. And uh, so, we, you know, it takes all day to, to go there and then get back home before dark. Because it's so far and you go, you know, the river's huge and you're in a boat trying to get there. But we went to visit with Bernardo and invite him to come to the next pastor training and give him the times and the dates. And before we left, we were sitting there and he said, I want to give your wife a gift. And I said, well, okay, yeah, I'll take it to her. And he came out, we walked out here and he took a big sack and dumped it out and there was turtles everywhere. And he gave, gave me two turtles to give to my wife as, as a gift. So we took them back and Growing up in South Louisiana, I learned how to cook uh, all kinds of things. So we made turtle cubion out of them, and it was pretty good. Everybody liked it. But one of the funnier things that happened was that uh, uh, we got back, and there, one of the ladies that uh, uh, was, when we have more than just Marcy and I there, you know, several people will we'll get one of the village, village ladies to cook. And uh, one of them was there, and uh, she was, I, I think she was a little bit jealous because <laughs> she told Marcy, uh, she says, you are a very blessed woman. I have lived here all of my life, and no one ever gave me a turtle for a gift. And now somebody has given you two turtles. So you are very blessed. And I thought, wow, that's uh, okay. <laughs> thought maybe, we, maybe we ought to give you one of them or something. I don't know. Anyhow, uh, okay, you recognize this guy. He just did the introduction in late 2015. Uh, it was later in 2015. We finally got our first uh, pastor training started. We realized over, you know, a couple of years uh, that uh, we would go to worship service, and the worship service consisted of a whole lot of singing and maybe five minutes worth of a lesson from one scripture, uh, one verse. And uh, so we said we need to we need to start some training. These people need to be taught. They need to get you know be fed some some meat. And uh, so in late 2015, Zach agreed to come down and do the first one. And uh, you can see we had maybe, I'd say, a dozen attendees from probably within 10 miles of our village up and down our, our river. Word got out, and uh, this was the first time that many of them said this is the first time anybody's ever come to teach us uh, more about the Bible. They're all, you know, they're kind of on their own. And uh, so... In, I think this is February, it may be March, but anyhow, early in 2016, this was uh, uh, River Bend Baptist Church. They came to teach. We, you know, we talked about it, and they said, yeah, we'd like to come do that. So they came to teach. This is the same room, and you could just barely get the door open. I mean, it was loaded. The, the whole idea had just exploded when these just a handful of people went back and started telling everybody else about how you could go there and spend a few days and be taught the Bible, you know, about, you know, different things uh, all day long. And uh, for four or five days, I mean, it just it started showing up from everywhere. And so we recognized this thing's good. This thing's getting huge on us. So we, we built this building. River Bend helped with that. And we built this building. We can house on this end. You see the doors. Uh, and we can house about 30 uh, visiting pastors on this end. The other end is that big room that you saw earlier with the children in it. And this is it. You can see that, uh, uh, you know, we've got plenty of room to, to have a big, a lot bigger class. This has worked out great for us. And so our pastor training has just grown in leaps and bounds. We had one uh, February or March. I can't remember now. I'm losing, losing which month it was, but the first one of the year, and this was St. Rose uh, Bible Church from over around New Orleans, it came and taught. And uh, <clears throat> this group here is not quite as big as uh, some of them that we've had, but we learned real 
quickly that, uh, you know, if the fish are running, uh, it's time to get the nets out and they don't show up. Uh, they live off the land. And so you, you just have to kind of roll with the punches on that kind of thing. But the group from St. Rose Church uh, did a great job. Uh, you notice they're all holding up a certificate. Uh, that's, you know, I, we, we, it took us a little while, but we finally figured out if you live in a dirt floor hut and you get a certificate that says you participated for a week and, and it shows that you did, that is a huge deal. I can just you know, imagine what it looks like in a dirt floor hut to have that certificate on the wall. That's a really big deal for them. And so we always try to hand out certificates. So uh, that kind of gives you the background and uh, where we, you know, this is kind of where we started. And this next, uh, this next slide is uh, somebody had a drone and brought it out and took a few photographs. On the right side of your screen is the village and uh, you can see the long walkway that comes into what we're calling today the Kokama Project, uh, the Kokama Mission Outpost. And uh, it's about 100 yards uh, uh, from our place up to the village. And uh, our, uh, the, the, one of the interesting things is that this property that we bought is still tribal land. And by Peruvian law, the tribe has uh, the right, uh, all rights to it, even though we bought it. And uh, they have, uh, uh, since they made us citizens of their village, they actually gave us this property to belong to us. So which is kind of funny because we already bought it. But uh, anyhow, you have, to, you have to play with the tribal law. That's the way it is. Okay, uh, see if I can get going. I'm going to swap over now. These two guys, and again, for those who have seen this before, know they've seen this, or they know what this is about. We had, uh, I'm holding a, that's a boat paddle. Uh, the, the, these two guys are, are from the tribe uh, Matses. And... Uh, their village leader had sent me this boat paddle as a gift, kind of to request uh, if they could send a couple of their uh, pastors to come to our pastor training that we do. And of course, yes, absolutely. They didn't have to give me a boat paddle, but it's kind of neat. Uh, these two guys uh, went back and told others, and they came back. The, the one on the right with the darker shirt is that he handles the youth or the young people, and the one on the left is, I think, the head pastor in their village church. Uh, tremendous stories when you sit down and visit with these guys. It's just amazing. Some of the things they tell you just blows your mind, you know, how they live and how, they, you know, they became Christians and things like that. But over time, uh, we decided that they live so far from us that uh, we decided we need to go there. and We need to start uh, doing uh, some road trips, I call it. And, uh, and instead of just having people come to our place all the time, go just start going out to these villages and have, have a week's worth of training there because we can reach a lot more people in their, in their own village. And uh, so Iquitos, you see there is the city we fly into Iquitos. Uh, that white line is the road, the one road that runs out of Iquitos. It goes all the way down to the river that we live on. If you, come, if you look right straight down from Iquitos and a little bit to the right, you'll see that red line and you'll see a, kind of a knee in it or an elbow. And that is about where the Matses tribe, tribal people live. It's a long way for them to travel. And they always say that. Uh, so we, uh, you know, we got the plane and we flew down to their territory and we got out and we were looking for one guy in particular because we'd heard a story about a year, year and a half ago about him. I'll get to him in just a second. But uh, we were standing around, we had some, we got out in the village and we were standing around thinking we were in the right place and two or three guys kind of surrounded us and was watching us very closely. And this man right here came out and he said, uh, I saw you standing out here and uh, I, want, I wanted to come and greet you. He said, I'm the pastor of the church. And he said, the Bible says uh, we're supposed to be nice uh, to strangers. And I thought, wow, you know, these other three guys are staring. They look like they're going to be very nice to us. But this guy came out and, and took us into his house. You can see the walls of his house here. Uh, they're made out of some kind of reeds or something. The floor is made out of the same. I was scared to death. I was going to break through the floor and fall through because I'm a big guy compared to them. But we had an absolutely fantastic uh, meeting. And this man sitting here with the you know, the bigger guy on the right, he, this, is, this is Luis Rios. Luis is a, he's kind of a right-hand man for us uh, down there. He's a believer. He's a brother. 
And uh, he translates, but he also does all kinds of logistics for us. He's just fantastic. He's, uh, he's really a big part of our Kokama project down in Peru. But uh, we had a fantastic meeting. You can see relative sizes of people here. That's why I was concerned about breaking through his floor. Uh, but he, you know, this is his family. So we, and we spent a lot of time with him, made friends. We got new friends there, uh, uh, prayed with him. Uh, his wife was a little bit ill. And so we spent time praying together. It was great. This next photograph is the guy we were looking for. These other guys sitting around and we sitting on the floor smiling. Uh, these other guys were the ones that kind of surrounded us, but we were looking for the guy in the middle with the longer hair. And his name is Manuel. And the story is, uh, there's a long story that goes with him that I don't have time to tell. But there's a tribal group over that we had heard about over in Brazil that are I incredibly dangerous. Nobody goes there because you go there, you don't come back. And we found out that this guy is not only a Christian, but he had built a relationship with them and he could go there. And so we thought, wow, there's our missionary right there. Believe it or not, middle of the jungle, so we, you know, we get to the right village and we find this guy. We had a great visit. And uh, basically he told us that he, uh, he wanted to go and, 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 and uh, you know, spread the gospel. He wanted to preach somebody, he didn't know how. And which, we, you know, we said, hey, that's what we're here for. We're here to teach you so you can go. And so, unfortunately, we had a, we had a, a training session uh, that we were going to do in April, and we had to leave because of the, the, the uh, COVID uh, virus thing that's been going around the world. And so we had to cancel that. But we are going back as soon as we can, and we're going to have that one-week training. So in fact, Brian was coming down. He was going to go with us. It was going to be two or three. It was going to be me and Brian and uh, Luis Rios there, and we were going to go teach for a week. And, and Manuel was going to be one of the guys that we teach – we were going to teach so that he could go out into the uh, uh, Brazilian jungle and find these uh, uh, Corubas is, is the tribal name of them. So anyhow, it's just amazing to me that we end up way off in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, Jesus said, go to the ends of the earth. And I always said, well, I think we live in there. And well, no, we're not. This is about a hundred and something miles south of where we live. So maybe this is the ends of the earth. I don't know. Uh, this is just kind of a verification. This is uh, Manuel. I don't know how he got this picture, but he, these are the Kurubos, and he's with them right there. And uh, he, uh, I, I, I have to be, I, I have to be honest. I had to crop this picture because the Kurubos don't wear any clothes at all. They just run around naked all day and all night. So, anyhow, this is a satellite shot of where we were. And if you look up, you see that kind of a knee in the river, the red, the separation between Peru and Brazil, Peru on the left, Brazil on the right. And if you look right above that knee, you'll see where there's a city down there. That's the city of Angamos. And if you look right above the city, you see an airstrip. That's that straight line through the jungle. Normally, the planes will land in the river, float planes. But when the river's down, we, we, when Luis and I went, we landed in the jungle. We landed on that airstrip. Uh, down below the knee, you see the, the squiggly line that runs all the way down to the left bottom corner of the photograph or the aerial photo, the satellite shot. That's the uh, Galbon River, and that is the river that so many of these Matses live on. And about as far as you can go down in that bottom left-hand corner is where their village was. Now, from Engamos, uh, you know, I took a GPS with me from Engamos to their village is roughly 30, 35 miles if you were to try to hike through that jungle. But by river, you can see the river turns and twists. It was like 80 miles. It took us all day long to get to their village. And it was one of the most uh, painful trips I guess I've ever been on, but also one of the most rewarding trips I've ever been on. These are children that put on a, a little show for us. They were singing. And I guess I really like this because this, uh, if you see the little girl there, a uh, third from the left with the white top and the kind of a dark uh, black looking uh, skirt on, I can't remember her name, but she rode in the boat with us all the way from Engamos for eight hours. And she is just a ball of fire. I fell in love with this little girl. She can speak three different languages. Her father is Matses, but her, uh, her mother was Quichua. And of course, they speak Spanish in Peru. She can speak three languages. She's eight years old. 
and uh, I just I just loved it. This was interesting. Uh, this lady, uh, when she found out two things, one is one that uh, I was a missionary. That was a big deal. I don't know how many of them told me they'd never had a missionary in their village before. This was really a big deal for them. Uh, but when she found out my name was Sam or Samuel, uh, she just lit up because that's her husband's name. And so it was an, an immediate uh, connection there just by names. And she, uh, she wanted to show me how they dressed traditionally. And she made that little uh, pouch thing that I'm wearing around my neck there. And she made that for me. And uh, <laughs> she has the, if you look closely, you can see the straw sticking out of her nose. They call these people the cat people. And uh, they, they tattoo themselves and they do things like put these straws in and they look, you know, trying to look like a jaguar so that jaguar will leave them alone, I guess. I don't know. You know, they call themselves the cat people, and uh, she was just a charming lady. I thought this was a worthwhile uh, photograph to put up. This is Pastor Orlando and his family. Pastor Orlando had visited us a couple of times in, uh, at our mission outpost, and uh, <clears throat> he made well, he made that spear for me. They actually still hunt with these things, and uh, you should have seen he was teaching me how to use the spear to kill a pig or something without uh, getting hurt. And uh, what? I guess if you don't do it right, I guess the pig will get you. But anyhow, they still hunt with these things. And uh, he is an absolute pleasure to, to be with. He's one of the pastors in their little church. And uh, I want to encourage you to look back at the uh, the handout uh, that Brian provided, because we have a couple of more uh, links to some YouTube. Brian, did a, uh, Brian actually did an interview with this guy. It lasted about 30, 35 minutes. And you wouldn't believe the things that these people have lived through. Uh, his mother, for example, uh, was kidnapped by this village uh, people and uh, when she was about two years old. So he was born in this village, so he considers himself Montes, but his mother was really not. And they would travel 30, 40 miles and, uh, by foot and go all the way into Brazil and raid a village and steal the women and the children and just all kinds of things. So I really encourage you when you have time to sit down for about 30 minutes minutes and listen and just dial into that YouTube and listen to this guy. Uh, Luis Rios is doing the translating. Brian was doing the questioning. And it's an incredible, uh, incredible uh, uh, interview. Another short one that I encourage you to look at is only about three or four minutes long. But what we learned here, you know, we came over here, uh, all this big long trip out into the middle of nowhere in the jungles looking for uh, one man that could go and reach a tribe of people called Karubos. And this guy said, yeah, we're very much aware of that. There's other people out there, too. And what we want to do is put together a team, uh, us and some of the other pastors from some of the other villages of people that can speak several different languages. And uh, so when we approach them, uh, maybe they'll, you know, they're afraid of them. The, the, you have to realize these people, if you show up in their village, it's no different than a jaguar. If they don't know who you are, they'll kill you. And so uh, you need to listen to the interview because it's incredible that, they, that God's already got his people on the ground right there, ready to go. And uh, once again, uh, we just need you to come and teach us so that we'll know how to do it. And we'll know what to say and, and all that. So uh, look at those links. Here's some of the names he named off, the Matzes, the Matis, the Kanamari. How do you say that one? Kanamari. Kanamari. Kanamari, the Marubos, the Karubos, and there's probably a lot more. Uh, so the mission field is absolutely enormous out in the middle of that jungle. The people are dangerous, but God's reaching them with, uh, in, in ways that we, we could never imagine. How in the world would you ever imagine that a guy like uh, uh, Manuel uh, had ended up making friends with, uh, with a tribe that's very dangerous, and he's able to go there, and he wants to go and tell them about Jesus. So what are we doing today? Uh, we did finally get a doctor down there. Luis and, uh, took a, a doctor with him, and we had some medication, some medicines and things, and uh, we've already lost a couple of people that we know of in, in our village to the coronavirus. And uh, so they went down, and one of the reports that I got back here in the United States was that the doctor was very concerned about uh, malnutrition and parasites in the children and, in, and some of the elderly people. Uh, we had a little food pantry going where we were just handing out food and they would take it 
back to their homes, uh, some of the poor of the village people. And so we kind of shifted gears on that. And now the, these uh, women that you see here will cook a meal every day. And you see all the kids lined up. They're coming down to get a good meal. So hopefully we can whip the malnutrition problem. Uh, you know, there's medications that'll take care of parasites, but uh, for malnutrition, you got to get some food in them. So that's what we're doing right now. We're, uh, we, you know, we're, we're just trying to, to, help, to uh, help them, you know, to make it through this mess that we're in with this coronavirus. And um, anyhow, uh, that's what's happening today. Really, it's, it's almost totally about food and, and just trying to help them uh, make it through until the country opens back up and we can get back down there. <laughs> I put this picture up here because it, it's one that I use, I have used many times. Uh, I don't know who to attribute the story to. Uh, if I did, I would, I would give, him, give him credit for it, but it's not an original story by me. But some evangelist or somewhere one time uh, was talking about how we, uh, you know, we're, we'll get, we'll, you know, when we invite Christ into our lives and we say we're going to follow him, we'll put him on the back seat and we'll try to go up a hill that we want to go up and then ask him to help us. And uh said, really, what we need to do is finally come to the point where we realize we need to be on the back seat and quit worrying about where he's going. And uh, just when he says, pedal, pedal hard. And when he says, put the brakes on, put the brakes on and quit worrying about it. And this has helped me many times because, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a retired engineer. So my whole life is uh, problem solving, uh, fixing problems. And I've learned uh, out there that uh, every time I get on the front seat, <laughs> Things don't go right, but uh, a lot of times, I've got a ton of stories I can tell, and we don't have time to do it right now, but I can, I can tell you that finally, when I realize that I've, I've swapped seats again, get back on that back seat and, uh, and say, okay, God, handle it, and I'll do whatever you tell me to do, things start working. And uh, I just wanted to pass that along to you if you're you know, I think it works. You don't have to be in the jungle for that to work. I think it works universally because we, we you know, Jesus said uh, the last command he gave was to go and make disciples and teach them all I've commanded you. First two commandments are repent and follow me. Well, you, if you're sitting on the front seat, you're not following. And uh, so I just wanted to bring, bring that up and make it uh, something that we can, uh, that everybody can be aware of, whether you're thinking about going into the mission field or, or whatever it is, just remember to stay on the back seat, okay? Go ye therefore, and that does not mean you have to move to the Amazon jungle, but what it does mean is that we're all called to be missionaries in one way or another, whether that's going, giving, it uh, doesn't matter uh, what you're called to do, we, we need to be obedient and do it. So that's all I have, Brian. Uh, are we getting questions or? Well, uh, we'll do some Q&A later. So be thinking about your questions. We'll have you paste them in okay. the chat. But you want to introduce Kyle and Alyssa? For yeah, us, let me just we'll really quick. Them. Yeah, Kyle and Alyssa are coming up, and this is uh, they're going to tell you their story. But uh, Kyle and Alyssa are two young uh, two youngsters. I call them youngsters. I'm old enough now I can do that. Uh, but they've, they've uh, surrendered to the ministry. Uh, they've been commissioned uh, to go, and uh, Kyle has been ordained. And uh, they're going to be joining us as soon as we can get back into Peru, which we think is early next year. We think we should be able to get back into our village. Uh, they're going to come and join. They've been there before, and uh, Kyle can tell you about that. Uh, but they've got uh, two beautiful little children. Elizabeth is the little oldest, and then they just had Jack. They were. Uh, I'll, I'll not say anything else. I'll let Kyle tell you because, anyhow, we are thrilled to death that Kyle and Alyssa are jo have joined us uh, in the Kokama Project. And, uh, you know, for me, I look at it as a future, just, uh, you know, uh, whenever, whenever we tap out, I don't want it to, I don't want the Kokoma project to end. And uh, this is just as exciting for us to see uh, Kyle and Alyssa coming in behind us. And we're really, really looking forward to this. So I'll let that go. And Kyle, uh, go for it. Thanks, Sam. And, um, thanks for the introduction. First, I want to say thank you to, to Brian and Will Press for putting this on. I think it's, it's amazing to be able to be here in the States um, and talk about what's going on in Peru and, and being able to pray for our brothers and sisters over there, especially now, um, especially with, with what's going on around us. Um, but more importantly, not only praying for our brothers and sisters in Peru, but all over the world who are affected by the pandemic and uh, 
for what's going on. I think from hearing Sam's testimony, um, we see the importance of obedience. Um, we see whenever Sam, Sam was obedient when he retired and they moved, he moved his family, him and his wife, to, to Peru in the middle of nowhere and trusted that God was going to lead them. And from that, this incredible wildfire has started in Peru and in the Amazon that's spreading. Um, and it's just, it's bigger than, than he can handle, which is a great problem to have. It's an awesome problem. So we just uh, thank you, Sam, for your obedience. And thank you for, for listening to what, what God told you to do. And we're just extremely thankful for you. When, in uh, 2011, I did an internship um, with I Am Ministries. I did a couple summers with, with Brandon Carroll. Um, he knew I was interested in missions. And he just wanted to show me the logistics of missions, show me what life is like on the field. And I am... I'm grateful for that experience. I was able to see what life is like, not from just a short-term trip, but what life is like having a family, raising a family on the field. I mean, just dealing with the day-to-day um, issues and um, just the operations and missions. So through um, I Am Ministries in 2013, uh, Brandon asked me to, to accompany um, Sam's group to a village to Nueva de Octubre. And so um, through that, I met Sam and I met Zach and um, I, I just completely fell in love with the people in the village. And I just, there was a burden in my heart for them and, and for what, um, what the job at hand was, which was evangelizing them. And then from that point, letting them evangelize their brothers and sisters, I um, mean, their neighbors. So uh, experience, um, God yeah, just kind of, kind of hooked me. And that was it. That was, uh, I knew that that's where I was going to be. And then um, later on, Sam started the Copama Project, and, and I kept, with him, kept up with him over the years. And, and in 2018, Alyssa and I decided that, that we wanted to go as a couple, and we wanted to see the village and really pray. I mean, just spend a week there and, and see if that's where God was leading us. And I can say it was an overwhelming experience to, to know that, that God was following us there deeply from that in the village and, and among those people. It was just incredible. So uh, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that this is where God is calling us and we're excited to to see what's going to happen. Yeah, and like Kyle said, um, 2018 was my first time going down to Peru. Um, Kyle had always talked about, you know, he feels like his heart's in Peru. Um, I had done missions in many other different countries. I didn't quite know where God was leading me. Um, prior to us getting married and we were married and just talking about it, you know, asking God, where do you have us going? Where, where do you want to send us? And, you know, we went in 2018, he's like, just come to Peru, just stay there, see what, what God kind of lays on your heart. And I can say, I left my heart there and, you know, God really did transform our eyes and, and really tell us very verbally that this is where he is drawing us to and I knew that this is where he had us to go because we left a three-month-old at home and of course we missed her but it wasn't that overwhelmingly sick feeling of leaving a newborn behind but we knew that this is where our home was going to be and that to me was a sign <laughs> a sign from the Lord that this is where we are supposed to go and that truly you know and now we've been working to uh get there and um you know sam said we have two children now and we have elizabeth and she's two and a half and then we have jack who is almost five months old and jack was born in costa rica because god sent us to costa rica first um to go to language school and uh, we've been in costa rica um august of last year through um this past april uh we were there learning being fully immersed in the culture um, at a language school um, to teach missionaries Spanish, and then they can go out and do what God has for them. Um, and so we've spent, we spent eight months in Costa Rica, um, and unfortunately we did have to come home due to COVID, and also um, Kyle's father did pass away, so we've been home since then, but we find that this is a truly um, a blessing to be home right now with family. Um, and we've continued Spanish um, class. Um, we have class every day, and we continue to um, serve the Lord in here in the States. Even though our heart longs to be with our people in Peru, um, to be here and to do what He has called us to do here. 
Um, and Brian, again, we thank you for setting this up because this is one of those things, informing people on what it is to be a missionary when you're not in another country. Um, I find that that is a, a wonderful thing. Um, so thank you for doing this for us. Um, but yes. Um, right now, as we're here in the States, our, our job is just, just to prepare. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, prepare ourselves um, spiritually before we go. Because we are planning to go to Peru in January um, if the borders are open and start working in January. So I would ask that you would just pray for us as we're, we're trying to prepare, um, as we're trying to move our family. I don't think there's really any way we can, we can prepare for that except yeah. pray that, that, God, uh, that God just gives us peace and that God gives us comfort, which I know he will. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Hey, uh, um, Luis Rios, turn your mute off. Can you hear me? Luis is in Iquitos, and uh, I just saw him pop up on the screen. I just want to introduce him. You heard me talking about him earlier. Uh, he's, he's fine. He uh he does all kind of things. Uh, he travels. Uh, he and I travel together to go to the matzis and uh, all those things. So, anyhow, turn your mute. Undo your mute. Can you do that? Just say hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Hello, everyone over there. How are you doing, guys? I'm so thankful that you invite me to participate in this co in this uh, conference. Thank you. I really appreciate. It. Thank you, Pastor Sam. Thank you, Pastor Brian Aber. <laughs> that's, 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 thank you, Pastor Zach, as well. We just I just wanted I had mentioned you earlier. I didn't know if you were on or not. I just wanted to get 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 a face with a name, and everybody can see uh, can see you and. Uh, thank you so much for being there and for being a faithful servant. So, okay, who you got? All right, so uh, we've What's got a, we've got a couple of folks who are going to share just a short testimony about their time there, and these are these are folks who came on a, a short term trip. So, Hector, I'm going to let you go ahead and go first. Okay, let me get unmuted here. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, I appreciate, first of all, uh, allowing me to, uh, to share uh, this evening. And it's so good uh, to see Sam's face. And uh, I've never met Zach before, your son, but uh, I'd heard a lot about him. So it's good just kind of putting some faces uh, to the names and the stories that we've heard in the past. And while you were doing this presentation and showing these pictures, it just kind of took me back. It seemed like it was so long ago, but it, it really wasn't that long ago. It was May 2018. Uh, that we had an opportunity with Wilcrest to go down and be a part of the uh, pastoral uh, conference that uh, the Kakama Project was holding down there. And uh, to me, it was, it was uh, I was looking forward to it because I'd been abroad to some other mission trips, but never to uh, a mission trip in which I got to speak my, my native tongue and, 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 you know, speak in Spanish and be able to, to communicate in my, kind of my, my heart language, uh, though it, it, it I will tell you, it, it did kind of backfire a little bit on me because when you speak Spanish, they expect you to know everything. And my Spanish was a little rusty, but thankfully, uh, you know, Brother Luis was there uh, to help us out when uh, when we ran into a little bit of, of trouble. But uh, but it, it was really a, a wonderful time. I, I will say that when you're looking at these pictures and you're looking at these maps, it it was an adventure. I mean, from the very beginning, from the moment that you leave on the plane and, and you get to Peru, and then from Peru, you take a, a, another little plane to get to Iquitos, and from Iquitos to Nueva de Octubre. I mean, it, the, whole, the whole thing just spoke intentionality. You know, intentionality from, from Sam and, and, and Marcy's standpoint, and from Zach's standpoint, and from all the people that, you know, God led to, to land in this, uh, in this village, but, but really it, it just speaks to God's intentionality, the Father's intentionality to, to reach out and be faithful to, to go out to the ends of the world and, and, and let his word be spread and then spread salvation um, uh, to, to the ends of the world. And, and, and it's funny that Sam said, said earlier where we thought we were at the end of the world, but we keep, we keep you know, finding out that we're not even really close. And it does seem like you're at the end of the world while you're there. But 
you know, it wasn't just intentionality about, you know, just being in spreading the gospel. But I, I, I will say, you know, it, it also showed how much, how much time and how much effort and how much labor, how much love has been poured into that village because you guys saw the pictures from where it was at the beginning to, to kind of where it is today. I mean, I, I get tired just thinking of all the, the work that I'm sure had to be put in to building the facilities and, and, and to making it all, all the accommodations to where these pastors can come from uh, all different parts of, of the Amazon river to be able to hear God's word, to be, be able to, to, to learn more. And uh, one of the things that really struck me while, while we were there, I think it's something that maybe, you know, anyone who goes there is going to come back with, you're, you're going to be humbled. Uh, you're going to be humbled because you, you get to, to see the, the hunger and the thirst for God's word in, in, in these pastors. They are journeying three to four days or, you know, multiple hours or days to just get there to be able to hear uh, more of God's word, to, to be able to understand it more deeply and more profoundly so that they can go back and share it with their people. And, you know, it, it, you come back humbled and convicted because, you know, here we have access to, you know, his word and to the resources. And there's a church on every corner and it's so available to us and we take it for granted so much. And so you, you get there and, and, and you can't, you can't help, but, but feel c convicted by their passion, their love for learning God's word and for going out and, and spreading it. So, um, you know, while we were there, we were able to uh, participate in helping, um, uh, in teaching the, the the word of God, we were responsible for different first uh, or, um, um, New Testament um, books of the Bible and kind of summarizing and, and speaking of, uh, of the big topics that were involved in each particular book. And there's a few people that are on this call tonight. I see Kelly Walker, who was there, and Pastor Jonathan, and and you know we all and Clayton, and we all went through different different books of the Bible. And we also got to do um, some um, chronological. Uh, Bible storing as well using the chron chronological um, Bible cloth and and so that was really really special as well so um, you know I, I would just say that uh, if, if you if you haven't been down there if you haven't had a chance to um, you know to go to be a go or not just a sender um, I would really pray about that because uh, man it will it will it will open up your eyes it will open up your heart to, to what God is doing beyond our little scope, beyond our little world of what's going on around us. You'll see that he is, he is just working tremendously um, and effectively uh, in, in, these, in these other regions and, and in the Cocama uh, region and Nueva de Octubre and, and now beyond even further beyond the, uh, the edge of the earth there. So uh, so thank you so much. I was, uh, I was really blessed by it. And, uh, thank you for allowing me to share tonight, Sam and, and Brian. Thank you, Hector. Uh, okay. Next we have Robin. <laughs> hey, thanks, Brian. Um, hey, Sam. And hey, Louise. Um, I'm just going to tell you all my story. Um, I went to the Kokama Project in August of 2019, so last year. Um, so I'm just going to start with a story. Um, I started climbing hand over hand, like up a ladder to a platform that was overlooking the village that Sam showed earlier. And the sun was on the way down and you could hear the little motor kind of going across the river with, you know, the little long boat that he showed you. Um, and as I climbed the water tower to the village, I had a couple thoughts. One, don't fall, because that's really going to hurt. And that hour and a half um, boat ride back to the the, to the city, that's where you're ruffling. And two, thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity. Um, so you see, my opportunity to go to the Kokama Project in the village of the 9th of October in Peru began actually in 2010, across the ocean. And on another continent, on a different hill up, um, overlooking the streets that had mopeds and bikes and people instead of boats and rivers and monkeys. Um, and it was on that hill in 2010 that I said yes, or yes. And I was saying yes to new people. Um, so I was filling out applications. 
um, to enter nursing school when I got back to the States. And nine years later, here I was climbing a water tower. Um, and some would argue that my whole lifetime was spent preparing for this. Um, but there's lots of school and conferences, books, reading, um, conversations with brothers and sisters in Christ, building skills in the hospital, um, opportunities, you know, just in different places. Opportunities finally came for all those theories to become practice. And as I reached the top of the water tower, on the platform, I began to reflect on the last five days that I'd spent in the jungle. So there were several ladies that I got to travel with, um, Nicole and Yaleen. Thankfully, two of them spoke Spanish, and Emily um, is pretty good at Spanish, a lot better than I do. In the first in the afternoon, we stepped off the wooden boat and we grabbed a villager's hand because he did not want to slip into the mucky water that he was showing you. And we picked up our carry-on size backpack um, that had our clothes. It had our plan for how we were going to engage the students and the community leaders and the pastors in health-related topics. And we began the trek Marcy. And it wasn't exactly about the time that we reached Sam and Marcy's, but it was pretty quickly thereafter that we moved from our plan A to plan B or E or F. I'm not sure which one. We were on by the top of the 500 yards up the stairs. So later that afternoon, we had several conversations with school officials and other team members, um, and we adjusted our plans for the first day in the schools to focus more on English and use the health-related topics. And so we learned very quickly that flexibility is a part of the jungle life, um, and that would be the key for the week. Um, remember those plans we got off the boat with? We used probably half a fraction of them. Um, instead, we sat down and we, every day we had to figure out how do we incorporate physical and spiritual and mental and emotional health topics, English lessons, because that's what the school officials kind of wanted us to do to engage the, the students. And so we would start planning the afternoon before um, in flexibility. We would finalize it on that five minute, 100 yard walk to the school. And then typically we'd we actually just wing it in the school um, with our so-called plans. Um, so I believe that health is um, holistic. So it includes like the whole person. It includes the physical and the mental and the spiritual and, and the emotional part of um, the person. And so we had different opp opportunities to kind of share in those different topics. Um, Alex and Yolene led a lesson um, with the English focus was on vocabulary. Um, the health focus was mental health, like dreams and aspirations. And they were able to share like consequences, good or bad, of actions and the choices that we make. Um, they had the opportunity to, to share their testimonies with the high school students, which was really awesome to, to watch unfold. Um, Nicole, Emily, and Olivia um, had travel size microscopes. Um, and so they took that mucky water and spread it out. Um, the same water that we were trying to avoid slipping in. The same water that the drainage goes into all the sewage water that only a few yards up the river they'll bathe in. Um, so that same water and they had a discussion on like germs and bacteria and how clean water um, is really meant to drink and to wash your hands and wash dishes like Sam was talking um, earlier. And so um, also come to find out if you do a quick change on lyrics um, to the tune of Baby Shark you can get kids to wash their hands for like 20 seconds. Um, so we built in that English aspect um, into a health health lesson. So we um, had a, a stretching session with the primary students. And then the same day we told the story and reenacted the four friends that lowered the lame man through the roof um, to Jesus and then he was healed. And so health was just, we were able to use English and engage the students um, with the topics of um, holistic health. And so between these school mornings, um, or these in the school in the mornings, um, and lesson planning in the afternoon, um, we also had the opportunity to visit with local community health workers. And so we had really practical conversations. Um, one of the questions they had was on blood pressure. And so we got to talk about the basic science of blood pressure and um, medications, healthy lifestyles, um, things that we often take for granted. 
And, and we had the opportunity to demonstrate how do you take a proper blood pressure? Because unlike the United States, it's not a quick push of the button. It's a listen and lots of practice to get those accurate numbers. And so we sat there on the concrete, what is now um, Kyle and Liz's how, room. Um, we sat there, it was still no walls, um, monkeys swinging in the tree. The preaching was going on across the way. And um, Cole and Yulene were just really able to use their Spanish to explain, to, to correct misconceptions, encourage the workers to learn the skills um, of taking a proper blood pressure so that they can better serve their communities and their families and their friends. Um, one of my favorite questions um, related to health was, how do I take care of a snake bite? And I was asked by a pastor that lived like several days up river by boat. He trekked into the jungle um, or he floated along the river to even further tribes. And Alex leaned over and he translated the question quietly to me in my ear. And I think I whispered something like, I don't know. I live in Houston. I work in a major hospital. I only like to snake. And then can I, you know, can I claim to be a city girl at this point? Thankfully, he didn't translate all of that um, to the pastor, but it started a discussion on what the pastors would normally do in this situation. So I listened carefully through the translation for areas that um, could have improvement on how they manage like clean water to clean the wound or first aid, like you want to clean the wound and then ban it. Um, and so I shared a few of the first aid thoughts and keeping the person calm so that the venom doesn't rush around the veins. Um, but their practices were so much more intriguing. That discussion, it didn't stop with the physical, uh, physical care. Um, I leaned over to one of the Osagares, I'm not sure which one, because they both translated fantastically for me all week. And I just said, remind them to pray because we serve a really great God. See, I didn't have like the spectacular precise textbook answer for how to care for snake bites because I don't care for snake bites. Um, but that's okay. God doesn't need my perfect answer. He just requires obedience. That same obedience that led Kyle and Alyssa to say yes, he required that of me. And in that moment, my obedience was simply to reiterate his truth to my fellow brothers and sisters. And so that evening, like five days into the short jungle stay, I was reminded that God gifts each one of us. He gives us gifts to glorify him, to serve him, he gives us those gifts and talents to be his hands and feet. Um, first Peter, and yeah, first Peter, he says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So for my story, um, it started in October of 2010 in Africa. Um, I have a journal entry that says, I'm filling out uh, essays for an RN application. The passion that he has given me to serve others is going to collide with medicine. It will be a long and a hard time of waiting and studying, but I find comfort in that he will use the time to mold me. And so here I was nine years later, and God gave me that first taste of that collision um, that he talks about in Luke, like to heal the sick and to proclaim the kingdom of God is near. And that got to happen in the Amazonian jungle in Peru with Sam and Marcy and the Kokama projects. That's kind of my story. Thank you, Robin. Okay, everybody, we are going to go into some breakout rooms. If you've never done this in Zoom, your screen's about to change, but don't be afraid. Uh, you'll be back here in five minutes. So what's going to happen? I'm going to paste. I'm doing that now into the chat bubble. I am uh, putting the prayer request. We have five prayer requests. We're going to go to this breakout room for <coughs> five minutes, and there are five people in each room. So uh, just very quickly divide up who's going to pray for what, and let's have a few minutes of prayer. And then we'll come back here, and we've got a couple other things before we close. We'll have a short time for Q&A as well. So here we go. All right. Welcome back, everybody. 
Um, in the handout uh, that you should have received an email, I also pasted it into the chat, the link for it. Uh, under the resources section, I have a couple of really cool things in there. One is a free book. It's a PDF online in eight different languages. Um, it's called Making Disciple of Oral Learners. So one of the things about the jungle is that it's uh, very story driven. And so we have to learn, particularly for us as Westerners, have to learn how do we communicate the, the gospel in story. I've also got links to uh, the Kokama project, web page, Facebook page, newsletter. Uh, there's the links to the different interviews. Uh, we did things <clears throat> like film the weddings. There's no narrative. You just can see what did the jungle weddings look like. Uh, all of this stuff is on YouTube and on the website. So all of those links are there. Um, there's a couple of opportunities I want to make you aware of. Uh, number one, this is under the future opportunities, is there's the opportunity to take a class. So uh, if you're a Wilcrest member, this is a prereq for people who go on our trip. But if you're not, this is still great prep and you're welcome to join us. We do this online. Uh, it's a class about uh, the animistic worldview and how do we engage that worldview with the gospel because they think about the world very differently than you and I grew up thinking about it. And so uh, we do a lot of teaching. We have folks from our church who are from around the world sharing about uh, what does animism look like in their culture. So you get to learn about more than just the jungle. Uh, we even pull some Western examples. Animism is making a comeback here in the States and North America. So that's a, that's a thing now. Uh, another option is join a trip. Um, there's how many, how many churches we have connected with Kokama Project that are taking trips? Five, we have, well, we had, we, we had planned on having four pastor okay. training uh, deals at our mission outpost yeah. this year, but we got knocked out with the, you know. So I assume ours. if you're on this call, you're connected with one of those four, four churches. So I'll speak on behalf of all of them and say, if you're interested in coming, talk with your pastor, mission pastor, whoever's the one leading the trip uh, about getting in on it. Um, and then the final thing is a jungle missions internship. This is something Sam and I have been talking about and something that yeah. we've been prepping for uh, it would probably be a summer long type internship program, which would be some time in Houston and some time in the jungle. So if you're interested in any of those, uh, please send me an email. Now, if you have a question for Sam, uh, you can type it into the chat bubble there. Uh, we have, we could probably take, uh, I don't know, three or four questions, uh, or if you can make it succinct, you can just unmute and say it, uh, quickly. Yeah, I was wondering the children at the school, do they, does, do they all go to school or do, is it like some of the other countries where they have to be in a certain economic class before they get to go? Because I noticed they had a lot of, they were in uniforms, it looked like. Yeah, the uniforms are uh, probably, uh, uh, probably rooted in uh, some, some uh, uh, Catholicism uh, type influence. Uh, and so, yeah, they all go to school. I mean, the village is four to 500 people. Uh, the only problem with it is they don't get very good education. We've had cases where we've helped a little bit with someone whose son, you know, wanted to go into town, take the test and see if he could continue on in uh, Nauta to go to a, a school to learn how to be a guide or something, you know, and uh, he failed the test. He just couldn't pass it. So, and he's not a dumb guy. I mean, he's a sharp kid, but the education is just not that good. They do go to school. Almost all of them go to school and they, uh, you know, that's all I can say about it. The educational system is pretty poor. So uh, we look forward to having Alyssa there as well as uh, oh, Olivia might show up one day, I think. And, uh, but they all do such a great job. Marcy is a, is a good mentor for that as well. So hopefully we can improve the, uh, the educational system in the village in the future. All right, any other questions? There, excuse me, there was a um, reference to somebody that had contracted the uh, COVID-19 virus. I, how did that get there? Can y'all answer that? Yeah, well, that entire jungle is suffering right now. Uh, they're, they don't have oxygen. They don't have things that you have here. Here, uh, you know, this, you go through the statistics and we hear different statistics, but uh, when someone gets sick, uh, if they're not 
just really in bad shape, uh, maybe they go to the hospital and get some oxygen and, and it helps a lot, but they they don't have that there. So uh, very difficult. Uh, they're, you know, malnutrition is not a good thing. I've, we've talked to infectious disease doctors here in Houston about this. And they said one of the big factors is just poor health uh, on, on whether they survive or not. So uh, how it gets there, uh, you know, yeah. All it takes is one person to show up and not know they've got it or something. And the next thing, these people live, listen, we've watched and and the folks that have been there can, you know, back me up on this. These kids, you really have to work with them. They'll, uh, you know, you give, you give one of them a red sucker and the other one a green sucker. And I guarantee you, they're going to all suck on the red one and they're all going to suck on the green one. They just swap, you know, <laughs> Lick on this one for a while and then swap it with the other guy so you see what that one tastes like. So tell them about the bowl of ice. The oh <laughs> tell you about the bowl of icing. Uh yeah, Marcy had baked a cake and she put some chocolate icing on a little boys came in and they kinda have their their, you know, who's the who's the top guy and all this and the one that uh, is the uh what do you call it, the alpha the alpha kid. Uh he there was some left in the bowl and he, you know, he got his hand in there and he he got it all, and he was, you know, eating like this. Well, then he had enough, and he had four of his little friends there with him, and so he had icing all over his fingers. So he would stick a finger out, and the the first little to the first little boy, and he would he would stick his finger in his mouth and suck the icing off, and then he'd stick the next finger out, and the next one. <laughs> I wish I'd have had a video of it because y'all's faces right now are priceless. It's just how they it's just how they live, you know. They're so uh, innocent in a lot of ways, but ignorant in a lot of ways too of good health practices and things like that. So, if one person gets a cold in that village, I guarantee you everybody's got the cold. It's just the way they live. They live so close to each other and uh, and uh, do things like that. So, all right, one last question. Hi. Um, just a quick question. So, how safe is it? Is it to go with a, like a like us as a family, or, or can we go with our children, or would it just be like an adult trip? How how does that work? Uh, we we actually it's kind of a tough trip, okay. And so you might want to think about whether you want to expose your your kids. I mean, there's. We've got COVID, but we've also got malaria and dengue fever and things like that. Now, you know, we protect ourselves pretty well against that. And uh, But if it was my family, I probably would be a little reluctant to take an entire family down there. An adult uh, can handle it pretty well. Uh, my my nephew, Zach's son, has been down there several times. Uh, I don't – Zach, do you remember how old was he when he first went down? 12, 13? Well, he's an adventurous young man, so I don't know if it's a good. Uh... That might not be a good example. My, yeah. my rule of thumb is bring someone smaller than yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we have for obvious reasons. We've had we've had a, a number of people that have brought you know one child, but a whole family. They might have a tough time with that. Uh, I don't know. That would I'm be a good question. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dad. I, I would say um, it's not a dangerous trip from the standpoint of violence it's a hard trip from the standpoint of you would think of it as extreme camping um because you're in the middle of you know nowhere with nothing uh, except for a small hut so it's just hard um i, I so i would say think through that if you if you have a, if you have a family that loves extreme camping maybe that is something uh, that your whole family could do i'll give it back to you dad okay go ahead you it's, i suppose it's all about perspective uh he's sam has just finished this new bunkhouse and i had prepped our last team of man it's going to be hot and it's going to be this and it's going to be that and then this new bunkhouse uh it's it's more like glamping now you know you're still out there in the middle of the jungle <laughs> But, you know, there's shower, indoor showers. <laughs> That's way better than trying to swat the mosquitoes in the outdoor shower. Um, you know, there's indoor toilets. There's fans. There, You know, so it's gotten a lot more comfortable. But just with, uh, with kids, you know, if they're taking malaria pills, there's a lot of, like, side effects to that. And, uh, yeah, it, it, the, the medicine you take can, can 
affect them adversely. Um, and and every once in a while we do. Most most people are okay. We have good cooks and we're very clean. We've taught them. Uh, but every once in a while somebody gets sick, you know, and it's uh, it's tough. Uh, bring your Cipro. You, you might need it. Uh, but anyhow, I. I I would encourage, I think it would be wonderful for a family to do this, but we would need to really need to visit about it and make sure that it's right for you. It is not uh, your typical trip. It's, it, it is tough. It's a, it's a, it's a tough environment. And, and like Hector was saying earlier, it's hard to get there. Just, just to get there is a, it's a battle. So, you know, you guys took all the fun out of it. The outside showers was, that was part of the fun, man. You went. I still right. use <laughs> Okay, uh, I know. I, I know you'll probably have a lot of questions. Sam is stateside right now, and you've got all the info to to connect with him. And uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to schedule a phone call or something me, with you. Yeah, let me say this. If, I don't know if you put that in your handout or not, but if you will go to our Facebook page, uh, the uh, it's just Facebook.com/slash Kokama Project all one word, and um, you'll see links to our newsletters. We call it the Jungle News. And if you bring up a newsletter, just bring up any one, there's a place in there where you can sign up to get the newsletter by email. I've, I've been pretty faithful about sending one out every month and sometimes two or three because we're, we're doing something and, and uh, I needed to get more out. So anyhow, uh, if you go there, you can sign up for the newsletter, the, and I'll put you in our, our MailChimp deal, and you can, uh, uh, you'll can you get the newsletter. You kind of keep up with what's going on. All right. I'm going to ask Jonathan to close us in prayer. Sam, I appreciate you sharing all the other folks who shared stories. Thank you so much. Uh, Jonathan, would you uh, close us in prayer? Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sam. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are so good and worthy of worship. And you are worthy of worship from all peoples, Lord. And I thank you for all those on this call tonight and just the different uh, callings and ministries and burdens that you have placed on the hearts of these people. And uh, I do pray you'll continue to cultivate within us a passion uh, to see the gospel reach all peoples, to see the gospel reach indigenous tribes throughout the Peruvian Amazon jungle, Lord. And I praise you for Sam and Marcy and this whole team of missionaries, Lord, and the calling you've given them. And uh, Lord, we give you all the glory for all the answered prayers for all these years, the way that you have just grown this ministry behind anything I know they originally imagined. And for all the those who've come to Christ, for all the baptisms, for all the relationships, with, for all the partners in the gospel, for all the pastors who've been trained in the gospel and the churches that are strengthened throughout the jungle because of that, Lord. We praise you for the missionaries who have gone, the missionaries who have supported financially and prayerfully, Lord, and uh, we just give you glory, Lord. You are moving, and we thank you for the joy to be a small part of what you're doing, Lord, and I pray for these missionaries, God. I pray you would open up the doors for them to get back to the village in your timing. I pray you'd open up more doors for the gospel to continue to go forward and uh, for your kingdom, Lord, to be furthered uh, for your glory, Jesus. And we continue to pray for more labors for the harvest, uh, that you would call out more and more people to be a part of this uh, mission, to be a part of this calling, God, uh, of making disciples of all nations, of every one of these tribes and people groups, Lord Jesus. Uh, I want to pray right now, Lord, for those who are in the village tonight, uh, for the believers, for the families, for the church there. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would allow them to cry out to you during this time of uncertainty, during this time where some of their friends have been sick, some of their friends have even passed, Lord. I pray that they would cry out to you, cling to you, draw near to you as you draw near to them, Lord. And I pray you'd allow these missionaries to get there soon, uh, to continue to encourage them with the gospel, Lord. I thank you so much. Jesus, for this evening, and I pray that for each of our families, God, conversations like this and stories like these would be common, uh, that you'd cultivate in our hearts just a passion for your mission uh, among the nations, Lord. Pray all this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm planning on doing a virtual mission trip about once a month, probably till COVID's over, so if you're interested in staying up with that, uh, if you're a part of Wilcrest, you'll get the news, but if you are uh, not, and you would like to stay up on these and participate and just hear about other ministries, just send me an email. So anyway, 
Thank you for flying Kokama Airlines. We know you <laughs> had your choice of providers. We hope the landing was not too rough. We are 10 minutes late. Just God bless. To be one point. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. The great encouragement. Nice to see you, Louise. Hi, Louise. Thank you. Hey, Bye. Louise. Hey, I texted to Jonathan. Gusano, remind me, remind me your your name and uh, and the uh, indigenous word. Yeah, Bunteri. Que quiere decir gusano, no? But Bunteri, right? Sí. I still remember that. Gusto verte, Luis. How you doing, brothers? Good seeing you, man. I'm pretty good. This is my wife. Really, it's, oh, hello. hello. I am really, it's an honor for me to be in this meeting with all this American brain, you know, <laughs> the best brain of the world. <laughs> we miss you, brother. Hopefully, we'll get back there soon, get to see you. But, and uh, oh, I was going to tell you, too, tell your brother you, that Jeremy Talaferro says hello. Okay, if you don't come, I will be I'll be going there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Even better. Hi, brother Brian. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Good to see you. Good to see you, Liv. Good to see all two guys. All right, see y'all. Good night, Thanks, Thanks everybody. <laughs> Hola. Olivia. Hi, Luis. I Hola. miss you. I miss you, my friend. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. I'm going to close the meeting. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all. Oh, man. I miss you. <laughs> oh, Luis. <laughs>